very happy to be here and I thank uh, Dima for inviting me. So I, I, my talk is maybe a little bit off uh, this, the main topic of this uh, workshop. Uh, I would have liked to talk about uh, networked economies that would have been maybe a little more uh, appropriate, but uh, this work is not uh, finished yet. So I, I'd like to talk about something that we worked on for the last few years with uh, Roma Alez, who was a PhD student, Joel Boon also, and Mark Potters. And uh, I hope that you'll um, find it interesting. And I think that you know, the topic is pretty general and has a lot of uh, different applications. And I'm, I'm, I'll show at the end one application to uh, financial data. OK, so in this talk, I'm going to look at random matrices that are constructed from something that I'll generically call a signal and something that I'm going to call some noise. Okay, so, so, so these are randomly perturbed matrices, and I'll be more precise about these uh, two components later. And the questions I'm going to try to address in this talk is not about eigenvalues that have been really studied a lot in the last, uh, I don't know, 60 or 70 years, but, um, but about eigenvectors. And in particular, I'm going to ask how similar are the eigenvectors of the pure matrix, the signal C, and those of the noisy observation of C, which is M. Um, so the similarity of the eigenvectors. And another question that's, uh, as you'll see, very interesting is how similar are the eigenvectors of two independent noisy observations of C? So the C will be the same, but the noisy part will be drawn from the same ensemble, but another sample, and you can ask how the eigenvectors uh, between these two uh, noisy observations are or not similar. And then I'll, I'll end by some applications. Uh, okay, so in order to be slightly more precise about the type of uh, random matrices I'm going to uh, consider, one I've already written, and I'm going to call it the free additive noise case. So in a generic case, I'm going to consider the C as the arbitrary matrix of course, of large size, because all these results will, in principle, be, that be valid when the size of these matrices uh, go to infinity. And then the noise component is made of a certain diagonal matrix B with an arbitrary spectrum and, and some random rotations O, o transpose. Okay. And you know, in a very loose way, this is what defines freeness between matrices. Two matrices are free if, in a, in a sense, the um, uh, basis in which they are uh, diagonal are randomly rotated uh, with respect to one another. And, and another case, which as you'll see is very important, is what I'm going to call free multiplicative noise, which in this case is uh, considering this matrix C again to be uh, a, a positive def definite matrix. And M is now the square root of C, the same OB O transpose square root of C. So the signal is here, and this is, this is the noise. OK, so there are many um, examples of such problems. One um, is a, a, an inference problem. You, you observe uh, M, and you would like to uh, reconstruct C as best as you can. And a very usual case in, in this uh, respect is when B has, uh, is a Wigner matrix in which case OB or transpose is also a Wigner matrix. So Wigner matrix means that all the elements are, are Gaussian independent. So you know, this is the most natural noisy case where you add to a certain deterministic matrix a random noise with a randomness on, on all uh, entries. Uh, you can think of this perturbation as for in quantum mechanics, like adding a kind of time-dependent random perturbation to the system. And this is considered in, in uh, models of quantum dissipations or things like that. And then there's the well-known dyson brownian motion, where uh, OBO transpose is actually uh, a Brownian noise. And uh, in this case, you try to study the stochastic evolution of the eigenvalues. That's the typical uh, uh, problem that Dyson looked at. But it's also interesting to look at the eigenvectors. So the arch example in the multiplicative case is when um, C is a covariance matrix. Okay. So you have observables, uh, for example, n times series of 
of length t. So as I'm going to show later for financial markets, imagine that you have n stocks, say n equal 500 if you look at the S&P 500, and you have a certain number of years of data. So typically there's 250 days in a year. So if you have 10 years, there are 2,500 entries. So what you're looking at are returns of, of these stocks and you're trying to infer from these returns uh, the covariance matrix. And so of course, what you have is a certain realization of these returns drawn from a putative a true covariance matrix and you try to reconstruct this covariance matrix from observation. And so in this case, what you observe is the empirical co covariance matrix. This you don't know and this is usually modeled as what's called a Wishard noise where OBO transform is XX transpo transpose where X is an N by T white noise, maybe Gaussian, maybe not uh, matrix. Okay, so as I said, the problem of knowing the eigenvalue spectrum of these matrices has been uh, beaten to death. Uh, something that's less studied is, is the overlap problem. And so what I'm going to focus on is this object phi of lambda i cj, which is defined as follows as n times, and I'm going to uh, discuss why the normalization in a second, uh, the expectation, and again, I'm going to discuss why we need an expectation here, of uh, the dot product, or the, in a bracket quantum mechanics notation, ui vj, where ui is uh, the eigenvector of m, of the noisy matrix associated to eigenvalue lambda i, <coughs> and vj is the eigenvector of c associated to eigenvalue cj. So I'm going to consider very large matrices, as I've said, n is much larger than one, and if you really look at this quantity for a given lambda and a given c, this, uh, without averaging, this doesn't converge to anything uh, in the large n limit. So it's better to actually average these overlaps. I, I forgot the square here, so it's the overlap squared uh, that I'm going to call an overlap uh, by uh, an abuse of language. Um, and, and so this thing, if you actually average over small intervals, say, around a given value of lambda, you can fix Cj, and you average over a certain small interval of lambda of width, um, uh, of small, very small width, but still much larger than one over n. In such case, uh, there's, there are still a lot of eigenvalues in these small intervals. Then this converges with something that we're going to compute. The n factor here means actually that the overlaps are very quickly of order one over n. So, if you want, as soon as you perturb a, mat a, a large matrix, the overlap with the initial direction gets very, very rapidly lost. And so it becomes of order one over n, and you have to look at, at this scale one over n to see something non-trivial. And the reason why these overlaps are very quickly small can be uh, into it. Uh, I mean, you can build an intuition of this phenomenon using this Dyson uh, Brownian motion picture that I alluded to. Because if you look, for example, that's very easy to derive, it's a second order perturbation theory if you want, uh, the evolution of a, a certain vector uh, <coughs> when you add a small perturbation to a matrix, that, that's an eigenvector. There's a term here which is deterministic, but there's a random term, and you see there's a lambda i minus lambda j here, which uh, hybridizes with all the other uh, eigenvectors uh, of, of different indices. And so this is a very efficient way to mix uh, and hybridize, as I said, uh, the eigenvectors. So very quickly, at each collision of these uh, eigenvalues, you, you lose uh, some coherence, and, and the, the, um, the structure of the eigenvector uh, becomes spread over a finite interval, and hence of order n um, eigenvectors. So that's really why you need an n here. Okay, so before telling you the results that, that we obtained, I need to introduce uh, some pretty standard, I mean, most of you probably know these uh, objects, but some of them are maybe uh, less well known, so I'm, I'm going to spend a little time on... Yes? Can I ask you one question on the previous slide? So you are 
discretizing uh, the eigenvalues over intervals. So lambda i. No, I'm averaging over a certain interval. I'm not discretizing. Okay, so lambda i and lambda j can be as close as the as the uh, as, as the one there. No, so so here what I'm sorry, what I'm going to compute is this object here, where lambda i. I mean, in the last line. Oh, I'm sorry. So so this is just an illustration of of this mechanism of why you lose coherence. So this is an exact uh, result. But if you look at the e equation for lambda i, then what you find is that collisions are uh, are avoided. So that's that's the you know repulsion of levels. But but they can come very close together, and when they come close together, you hybridize with um, with the rest. Okay, so um, so the the most used tools in random matrix theory is is the so-called resolvent or or uh, uh, well, there are many names for this object, but the, the resolvent is just the inverse. So M is again our noisy matrix. Z is a complex number, and and so you consider this matrix Z times the identity minus M minus one. So the inverse of Z I minus uh, M. And from the knowledge of this object, you can, for example, recover the spectral density or the eigenvalue distribution, the, depending on, on the background physicist or math that you prefer. So if you take the imaginary part of the normalized trace of this uh, resolvent computed at lambda minus a small imaginary part, and you take the limit where eta goes to zero, then this gives you uh, pi times the, the density of eigenvalues at, around lambda. And interestingly, if you are interested in the overlaps, then it's very easy to show the, the similar formula. If you take the, if you bracket the imaginary part of the full matrix now between VI and VI, uh, where again VI is uh, the uh, uh, the vector, the eigenvector associated to eigenvalue CI, then again when you take eta goes to zero, you get this quantity becomes pi times this density of states times the overlap, the normalized overlap that I talked about. So in practice, again, it's very important to understand that eta is the resolution scale at which you look at your uh, eigenvalue spectrum. And so in order for all this thing to make sense, and in particular, in order to, in a sense, automatically compute these averages over small intervals around lambda, you should take eta to be small, formally to go to zero, but still with in mind the idea that it must be much larger than one over n, so that you know, these, uh, these, these objects actually, in a way, are microscopes that zoom around some lambdas, but with some finite resolutions, and this resolution should not be too strong, so you shouldn't be able to look at individual eigenvalues, but uh, some kind of coarse-grained version of them. Okay, once you get, once you have these, uh, the Stilges transform, uh, which is a, again a normalized trace, you can define more objects. So, for example, uh, you can define, so, so G is all, often also called a green function. So, um, um, uh, Tony Z introduced a, a name for the, in, uh, the functional inverse of G, which is the blue function. So the blue function act acting on the, G func on the green function is identity. And with the blue function, you can construct what's called the R transform, which is the blue function minor minus 1 over Z. And you'll see why this is an interesting object. And for example, if you compute the R transform of a Wigner matrix, it's very simple. It's just a, a linear function of Z. You can also introduce another transform that's called the S transform. <coughs> Again, it looks very abstract at this point, but you'll see why these objects are interesting. So you know, it's a little bit more involved. You have to define this quantity, and then from this T transform, there's a formula for the S transform. And you remember, remember I talked about Wishart matrices. So Wishart matrices are defined, if you want, as the empirical covariance matrix you would measure on white noise. So if you have time series, n time series of uh, length capital T. So in principle, the true covariance matrix is, is identity. There's, there's no structure. But if you measure on a finite data set this covariance matrix, you'll find something different from identity. And what you find is, is a member of the Wishart ensemble. Uh, 
<laughs> and so the, the, the S transform of, of a Wishart matrix is given by 1 over 1 plus QZ, where Q is a very important quantity that will come back later, is the ratio of the size of the matrix to the length of the time series. And so, for example, when T goes to infinity at finite n, it means that you have a lot more data than you have uh, time series, and therefore in this limit you will recover the fact that the empirical covariance matrix is the identity which is the true covariance matrix. So when Q goes to zero, it means that you remove the noise, and when Q is large, there's a lot of noise. Okay, so the main uh, theoretical result that we got uh, with uh, the collaborators I, I alluded to uh, in my first slide that's published in I, uh, EEE 2016 is the following, is that you can actually compute in the large n limit uh, the green function, the, 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 the matrix green function, the resolvent uh, for uh, this noisy matrix M and express it in terms of the resolvent of the pure matrix C. And the point is that in order to do that, actually there, you know, you can, re you can forget about brackets in the large n limit, this becomes uh, true uh, self-averaging. Uh, but the, the point is that you're not computing these objects at the same uh, point in the complex plane. And this is really what makes the whole story interesting, as you'll see uh, in a minute. So for example, in the additive case, so you remember the additive case is, is this one. So it's described by a certain diagonal matrix B, uh, and then these uh, random rotations. Then capital Z of small z is given by uh, a self-consistent formula, which is that capital Z of small z is z minus the R transform of the B matrix computed at point GM of z. But of course GM of z is going to be the trace of this matrix. So this is a, a self-consistent equation defining capital Z of z. In the multiplicative noise case, there's a similar formula that involves the S transform of the matrix B. So how do, did we get these results? Well, you can use uh, you know, what physicists like to do, that is a, a replica calculation. Um, I, I won't at all give you details, but if you use the replica representation of the resolvent, which is a kind of Gaussian integral with zero dimension, and use uh, uh, the Hari Chandra, Itzik, and Zuber uh, formula in the low rank case, then you can pretty easily obtain these formulas. What's easy to check is that if you take the trace of these matrix equalities, then you recover what are called the free convolution rules. And maybe some of you uh, are familiar with, with this uh, quite amazing result, I think, is that uh, if you have free, the sum of two free uh, matrices, then the spectrum obeys this uh, sum rule, in a way, uh, convolution rule, which is the R transform of the sum is the sum of the R transform. And similar in the multiplicative case, the S transform of the product is, is given by the product of the S transform. So this is just a consequence of this more general result that holds true for, uh, uh, in, a, in a matrix sense. Okay, so now we have all the ingredients we need to uh, go back to the main topic of my talk, which is the, uh, computing this object. And as I've said, this object is actually hidden in uh, this, um, this uh, dot product of G VI with VI itself. So, okay, you turn the crank and one gets explicit formulas for these uh, functions phi of lambda and C, which are th thus these kind of coarse grain average of the overlap squared of the corresponding uh, eigenvectors with in mind, again, the factor n that I en emphasized a lot at the beginning. So all these curves, should, you should think of them as, as actually very small. They're over the, over the one over n, but we blow up to, to see the structure. So for example, if you have a matrix to which you add um, a random um, uh, uh, term, so for example, if B is a Wigner um, spectrum, so it means that the, uh, the noise that you add to C is, uh, say, independent entries with, with a second moment that's finite. They don't necessarily need to be Gaussian. Then there's a lot of universality in this problem. And what you get is that uh, 
the overlap is given by this uh, expression. So what you see is that there's a c minus lambda squared here. So this is a Cauchy-like formula uh, as a func for, for a given lambda so as a function of c or for a given c as a function of lambda uh, with a certain width which is given by this, this object. So, so this is the shape of these functions. Say for a, a given lambda as a function of c, it peaks around the, uh, uh, the unperturbed uh, uh, um, eigenvalue but there's a, there's a dispersion and what you see here are the blue lines are the exact formulas and the dots are numerical simulations to, to check. So you can check for example when, when sigma goes to zero so when there's no noise you should expect this phi of lambda c to become a delta function at lambda equals c because in this case you, you don't perturb at all the eigenvectors and that's, that's what you recover. You, you, I mean, you can see that when sigma goes to zero you have a Cauchy distribution of width zero and, and the, the shift is also zero so this uh, Cauchy distribution be becomes a delta function. But the Cauchy distribution has also this interesting uh, property that it decays very slowly as a function of the distance between c and lambda and in particular it decays as a power law so it means that the initial um, eigenvector actually spreads out very far in the, with, a, with a very slowly decaying tail um, and this is again related to this uh, kind of uh, um, um, Dyson uh, mixing that I, that I alluded to uh, before. Um, so this formula, as I said, is, is true for all Wigner-like matrices. It's, you don't necessarily have to perturb with a Gaussian noise, provided the noise as a second moment. This is, uh, this is a universal result, which is interesting, actually. There's a, a similar result for multiplicative noise and for the case of empirical covariance matrices, which is the most uh, relevant example, then you get again uh, an explicit formula where you see uh, appearing explicitly in the formula the Q-factor. So you remember the Q-factor is the ratio of the size of the matrix, the, the, the number of time series that you want to correlate with the uh, uh, number of, 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 of time uh, steps that you have to measure them and again what you see is that when q goes to zero which means that you have uh, a lot more data points than you have uh, time series then it, again this this thing uh, tends to a delta function which is what you expect and this result this explicit result was actually obtained in 2011 in a beautiful uh, paper by uh, Le Doy and, and Pichy you mean what are the assumptions on the matrix C on the on the? No, no assumption, no assumption. The identity function, because you said. Mm. No, are we okay? Uh, well, in the identity, there's a degeneracy, so that there's a problem there. But uh, if you have a uh, if you have uh, you know generic matrix with non-degenerate uh, spectrum, then this is. Just uh, your slide before, uh, just before concerned the uh, just after, yes. So it concerns the, the resolvent itself, not, not the trace. No, exactly. This is a matrix identity from which you can get a trace result and the trace result are these ones. Yeah. Yeah. So the trace are for the spectrum. And, but you, it, what's interesting is that if you keep the full matrix structure, then you get information on the eigenvectors. Okay, so there's an example which is, uh, well, maybe a little bit related to your question, which is interesting, which is the case where C is actually of rank 1, so there's a, a unique uh, non-zero eigenvalue uh, gamma, all the other ones are zero, and you perturb this with um, a Wigner, uh, sorry, uh, yes, a Wigner, a Brownian motion, W of T, a Brownian matrix noise. And, and so what's interesting is that in principle all these, uh, strictly speaking, all these results are true in the uh, n go to infinity limit, but, but they still make sense to order 1 over n and so you can still use this formalism and if you're careful keeping terms to order 1 over n then you get exact results that have been obtained uh, using different techniques and one of them uh, that I want to emphasize is the so-called baïk benarus pechet transition which is what happens in this case. So again you start from a spectrum where there are um, uh, n minus 1 eigenvalues equal to 0 and 1 equal to gamma which is equal to 5 here uh, 
So that's at time t equals zero if you want. And then you run this uh, Brownian noise W of t and you see how the spectrum evolves. And what happens, so if you do that without this uh, outlier, so-called outlier, then it's clear that what you have is zero plus a Wigner matrix, so you have a semicircle law that appears and the, the width of the semicircle grows with time. And so, uh, so this, is, this is what you see. You, you see actually lines, this is a really uh, a numerical simulation. So that the, all these lines here, uh, they repel each other and they occupy uh, a parabola. And inside the parabola, the, the, the spectrum would be a semicircle. So in this parabola, you have for each time a Wigner semicircle of radius two sigma uh, square root of t. And there's something happening to the isolated eigenvalue as well. And again, this you can grab using uh, the, the previous results to order one over n. And you find that the uh, outlier has another dynamics. It evolves as gamma plus sigma squared t over gamma. So it's, a, it's more or less a straight line. And this is true as long as t is smaller than a certain critical time, which in this case is gamma over sigma squared. And what happens when t reaches t star is, is this uh, star here, where the red line crosses the boundary of the Wigner semicircle. And in this case, the outlier just disappears. It's eaten by the, by the Wigner C, and it's, it's in a sense a true phase transition that is called now the BBP transition after Baik, Benarus, and, and Pichet. So for t greater than t star, there's no isolated eigenvalue anymore. It's just the, the semicircle. So you can ask also, so, so this, as I said, you get from um, uh, the, the R transform formalism to order one over n, but you can also ask what happens for the overlaps. And for the overlaps, what you find is that the overlap of uh, this isolated eigenvector with itself, with what it was at time t equals zero, is equal to uh, 1 minus t over t star. So you see when t is 0, the overlap is 1 because you haven't done anything. And when t goes to t star, then uh, it's the last moment where the uh, isolated eigenvector remembers the structure it had at time t equals 0. After that, it's completely lost in the Venus C. There's actually, in, in an informatic, inf information theoretic way, there's no uh, way of recovering uh, the information contained in the eigenvector, in the initial eigenvector after this time, or when the, the amount of noise is beyond some critical value. Um, what happens just at T star is, to my knowledge, not known or not written. And one, I mean, if we do hand waving um, arguments, you can conjecture that precisely at T star, the overlap goes down to zero as, as n to the minus uh, one third. Okay, so now I'm going to try to uh, show how you can use these results for um, something concrete. And uh, the, the question I'm going to ask is an inference problem. Is uh, you observe a random realization of this noisy observation, M, and what you would like is to have the best estimate of C, of the, the true signal C, so for example, the true covariance matrix or the true matrix to which you add uh, some noise, knowing M. And, and what I'm going to assume here is that the problem is rotationally invariant in the sense that there's no information that you have about the problem that allows you to privilege some directions in, in space. So you have no idea of where the true eigenvectors of C are pointing uh, in space. And so in this case, the best you can do is to assume that your estimator is going to have the same eigenvectors as the noisy, as your observation. Because this is the only thing that breaks the invariance is the observation of the covariance matrix or the noisy matrix M. So you're stuck with these uh, directions if you want. There's nothing else you can do, except if you have some information about the problem. Of course, you might have some information about the problem that tells you that some directions should exist for symmetry reasons or, you know, but here we're assuming that there's nothing, the, the, the prior that you have 
has no information about the directions in, in, in the n-dimensional space. So the best you can do, the only thing you can do, is to write that your best estimator is going to be the sum over the eigenvectors of the noisy observation, again, that's the, the only thing you can choose, times some uh, uh, pseudo or uh, dressed eigenvalues, if you want, psi i, that you have to determine. Okay? So now if you, do, if you try to minimize the distance between uh, the L2 distance between uh, Xi and, and C. So how, you know, what's, what's the closest you can get to C using this representation? Then you find uh, conditions that fix these Xi i, and these Xi i's are given by this equation. So it's a weighted average of the true eigenvalues uh, of C multiplied by the overlaps. But you stare at this formula and, and you, you see that there's something completely stupid about this formula, which is that I want to know c. So if I express psi hat as a function of things that I don't know, this is called, in a way, the oracle estimator, you've done nothing useful because you want to have this best estimator psi hat as a function of things that, if you knew them, you would not need to estimate them. So this formula looks to be uh, empty. And what I'm going to show you is that for some kind of miraculous reason, in the large n limit, you can estimate these objects without knowing c, just knowing what you observe. Okay, so here there's a little bit of uh, transformations. So this formula, you first re-express it as, uh, in the large n limit as an integral rather than a sum. And so these overlaps appear like, like, like the object I've defined before. And it so happens that you can uh, re-express this integral like this. And by using um, the rules that I've uh, written here, in the end, you get a result that where C has disappeared, only M appears. So for example, in the additive case, you get that what you should do is you take the empirical eigenvalue, that's lambda i you've observed, this is the eigenvalue of M, and you transform it using a function f1 in order to get this, this dressed eigenvalue psi i hat. And this function only depends on objects that are known once you've observed m and you know the structure of the noise. So for example, here is the, uh, the real part of the, uh, of the CLGS transform, the Hilbert transform of the spectrum. And, and you see alpha 1 and, alpha and beta 1 are kind of complicated functions, but they only involve m and, and the noise. Rb is again the R transform of the, of the noise matrix. So everything only depends on, on m, and of course you have to know something about the noise. Uh, so every, if everything is Gaussian, what you get is the well-known uh, formula that w when you observe Gaussian, so one-dimensional ga uh, Gaussian variables, if you know that you're observing a Gaussian variable with noise, the best estimator of, of, the, uh, of the variable itself is uh, the variable you've observed times the signal div divided by signal plus noise. So, so this is the one-dimensional version of this complicated formula, if you want, in the Gaussian case. So in the multiplicative case, there's a similar formula that again only involves m and the structure of the noise. So gamma b and omega b are, are the equivalent of, of, of these uh, transforms here. And so in the empirical uh, covariance matrix case, you get this explicit formula, f2 of lambda, how you should uh, renormalize the empirical value to get the, the estimator, is lambda divided by this uh, object. So again, you see that when q goes to 0, you don't have to do anything because you observe perfectly the matrix. And if q is non-zero, you know what to do. So this is a, an example uh, of uh, this function f2. This is the observed lambda. This is how you should change the lambda to get the best estimator. It looks very close to a straight line, which in this context is called the linear shrinkage. So for a long time, people have proposed uh, to transform the eigenvalues uh, in a very simple way, just uh, in a linear way, in, a, in, a, in this kind of, of very simple fashion. Uh, but, but you see that in, it's actually, in general, more, more complicated. Okay, now what's, I think, 
maybe even more interesting uh, for some application is that you can extend the techniques I've uh, explained to you for another problem, which is not the overlap of the matrix of the eigenvectors of M with those of C, but the eigenvectors of M with those of another realization of this random matrix problem, M prime. So here W and W prime are two independent realizations of the noise. And what I'm looking at here is this different overlap, phi, between uh, the vector close to the eigenvalue lambda of the first realization and close to the eigenvalue lambda twiddle of the second realization. Okay, so I think it's pretty explicit. And again, using the kind of techniques that I've, I've uh, told you about, you can actually get a rather cumbersome, I haven't even there to write the full formulas, but explicit uh, uh, formula for this phi of lambda lambda twiddle for the additive case or for the multiplicative case. So for example, you know, uh, it's, I haven't, even if alpha and beta, I, I've not shown them, but there's a function uh, phi of q, q twiddle. These two matrices may not even have the same uh, signal to noise ratio and n over t ratio in the uh, multiplicative case. So, so there's a formula, I mean, which depends on, on the parameters of the problem. And if you want to, to imagine what these formulas look like, then this is for a, a fixed lambda twiddle, the overlap of the eigenvectors of one matrix compared to those of, of, of the second one. It peaks around lambda twiddle, but it has a sign, again, a kind of Cauchy shape. So the red line is again the theoretical formula and the, the dots are um, numerical uh, experiments. But what's really cute, I think, is that this formula this, that I haven't shown, this phi of q, q twiddle in the multiplicative case or the analog formula for the additive case, it doesn't depend on C. You just need to know m, m, m prime, which, is your, which you observe, and from m, n, m prime, from the knowledge of MMM prime, the, the spectrum, you can calculate what you expect to be the overlap between uh, lambda and lambda twiddle. I mean, the overlap between the eigenvectors corresponding to lambda and lambda twiddle, assuming that they both come from the same ensemble. So assuming they come from the same ensemble, then you're able to compute this function without knowing C. So it's a, it's a kind of a strange result, right? You, you're trying to test whether M and M prime are coming from the same ensemble, but you, you don't know this, and you, you don't know the uh, generate, uh, generating matrix C. So it, it can be used to test actually whether your two observations originate or not from the same unknown C. Uh, and the formulas that you get are interesting because they are universal. You don't have to assume much about the noise. So for example, if everything was Gaussian, then you could have other ways of testing this hypothesis. But what makes the, uh, the, the result, I think, quite interesting is that you don't have to have a lot of knowledge about the, the structure of the noise to get in the large and limit these uh, universal uh, formulas. So, okay, so it's interesting to apply these, uh, this idea to financial time series because fi uh, it's very hard to imagine a priori that the financial markets are the same between, say, 1990 and 2000 and between 2000 and 2010. So, so it's interesting to see whether if you measure empirically the covariance matrix on, say, 10 years and then on 10 subsequent years, can you test whether the true covariance matrix that you don't know, you only know the, uh, the observation. And by the way, if you see that this quantity Q, which determines the amount of noise, the, the, the lack of knowledge that you have about your problem, it's very, uh, uh, very difficult to have small values of Q. Again, Q goes to zero is the perfect signal case. Um, but in this present era of big data, say, it's, you know, you consider, say, I said 500 uh, stocks in a, in a portfolio or 500 stocks in the S&P 500. And I said 10 years, 10 years is 2,500 points with daily data. And so this ratio is 0.2. So it's not very small. So you're clearly in a, in a high uh, noise uh, regime. 
because because you have a lot of objects. Um, so um, so this is the overlap that I just talked about at the same value of lambda. In principle, you could make tests for different values, lambda and lambda twiddle. I'm specializing this formula to the case where lambda equals lambda twiddle and q equals q twiddle. And in this case, what you get is, so if you zoom on the part of the spectrum where most eigenvalues of the covariance matrix uh, lie, you get uh, the empirical points are the green points and the prediction, okay, don't worry about the, the fact that there are two lines, there's some slight um, um, subtlety here that maybe if you're interested I can tell you about, but look at the red line. The red line is, is not bad, it's not, bright, it's not exactly on the data points, but as I said, it, there's a little bit of ambiguity here on the value of Q that you should uh, use. And again, for reason I, I, I can explain. But suddenly, if you zoom out and look at the largest eigenvalues of the covariance matrix, uh, the predictions, the theoretical prediction, if the covariance is the same um, in the two time periods, so I don't remember here if it's uh, probably it's 2000, 2010, and 2010 and beyond, then you see that there's a very strong discrepancy. The, the overlap is much smaller than what it should be uh, if the true covariance matrix hadn't changed. So the conclusion is that the large eigenvectors are unstable in a sense. It's not a problem of noise, it's not a problem of observation, it's really the structure of the underlying problem that makes the uh, eigenvectors evolve with time. And this is a conclusion that we had obtained already using different methods with uh, Romales. And what you have to realize is that this is extremely important for portfolio optimization. The reason is that these large eigenvalues uh, in terms of risk, they correspond to portfolios. Portfolios define direction in space, and these directions are the most risky ones. This is the risk associated with the corresponding portfolios. And so, if you think that you're neutral in the direction of largest risk, but these directions of largest risk shift with time, then you're exposed to kind of unknown risk that were well, not in your risk model. So here, you know, I've shown you a kind of eyeballing test, it's just by the eye, but it would be interesting to turn this into a true statistical test, and this we haven't done, and in particular there are subtleties about the hypothesis. This uh, change of value of Q comes from the fact that there are, it's, it's, not a good, it's not a very good model to assume that the data is completely white noise. Okay, um, so I told you that this overlap function between two realization of the same uh, two realization of the same ensemble is an ugly formula that I haven't written, but there's a simple it interpretation uh, of this formula, which uh, you you probably will understand intuitively. So remember what I call now phi zero. Phi zero is the overlap between m and c. So this is, these are the objects that are considered in the first part of the talk. Phi now is the overlap between two uh, different realizations. And so what you can write by definition is that uh, the eigenvalues of the noisy matrix is a superposition of the, uh, sorry, the eigenvectors of the noisy matrix are a superposition of the eigenvectors of um, the, the underlying uh, pure matrix, V mu, with the square root of the overlaps, which gives you the weight of u lambda on v mu, and, and random sign factors, epsilon mu lambda, and then uh, you have to integrate over all mu's with the corresponding uh, eigenvalue density. So if you compute the overlaps between two uh, eigenvectors corresponding to different uh, realization of the same problem, then you get uh, something like this. And now if you, if you make what's called uh, in this field the, uh, an ergodic hypothesis, that is that all these phase factors, all these signs are completely random as soon as mu and, and, and lambda are different, then by, by taking the average over this, you, you get this kind of triangular uh, convolution formula, which is that the overlap between eigenvectors at lambda and lambda prime for the problem of mm prime 
is a convolution of the overlaps of the pure matrix with one of them and the pure matrix of the other, which I think is kind of triangular equality that, that is intuitive. But if you use this formula, then, um, um, then it appears to depend on C, because for example, there's this uh, explicit uh, density of eigenvalues rho C. But as I've shown you, the, 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 in the end, the dependence of C on C disappears uh, for phi. Um, okay, there's maybe I should. Do, uh, how long do I have? 15 minutes, sir. Oh, okay, okay. Including questions. Okay, so I have time for... So this formula here has, um, has an interesting consequence for applications, which is uh, the following. So I'm again going to um, reconsider this problem of, um, of the estimation of my random matrix. Again, I'm, I'm coming back to, to this problem here, okay, and this formula here. And what I'm going to show is that using this formula, you, you get uh, a representation that's very useful empirically, and that uh, makes, again, a lot of sense. So the idea is to consider a first realization of your problem with uh, eigenvectors ui, and then you take a, a, a second realization, independent realization, uh, uh, with, uh, I'm sorry, I, sh I should have called it M here. So this is M prime, uh, which is an independent realization of the, uh, of the covariance matrix. And what I'm defining are these objects nu i of Q, which are the projection of this uh, independent realization on the vector corresponding to the first realization, bracket, bracketed with u i itself. So again, all this can be measured empirically. And what you get using the convolution formula is that this new i of q is actually exactly given recovering xi i hat. So this is called a kind of cross-validation or out-of-sample estimator of xi hat, where in a sense you don't even need any formula, you just um, compute this with uh, an out-of-sample or a, a cross-validation period to determine the covariance matrix C. And so that's how you, it, it looks like if you do this uh, um, experiment numerically, this is real financial data. And, and so all these points here are pointwise uh, est estimation of, of this formula. But when you average uh, what we call here the, this oracle estimator, you get the, the, the blue triangles. And uh, the formula, the analytical formula that I told you about is the, is the green one. So this is, this is an easy way if you want to estimate these xi hat that you need to use in your uh, L2 estimator of the covariance matrix. Okay, so let me uh, conclude and, and uh, give a few problems that I, you know, at least I, I find them interesting. So I try to um, tell you that the free random matrix results on the R transform and S transform for the Stilges transform can be extended to the full resolvent matrix, and this gives access to overlaps. And these overlaps formulas lead to what I've called here large dimension miracles, that the, 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 the so-called oracle estimator, that when you write it down, you have the impression that you're writing something silly because you're expressing things that you would like to know in terms of things that you don't know. So, uh, but, but in the large end limit, it turns out that, you, that it can be estimated. Um, and in particular, this hypothesis, large matrices are generated from the same underlying matrix C without knowing C. This can be uh, tested. And as I told you, it's very useful. In, in some cases, you have a physical model, so you, you may have some in information about C. But in the case of financial markets, for example, there's nothing really that you can use except the data itself. So, so as I said, it's an eyeballing test at this stage. I think it would be interesting to turn this into a true statistical test, at large n. Um, something interesting that we've done recently with uh, Florent Benaish and, and Mark Potters is to extend this to uh, the SVD of um, more complicated 
um, covariance matrices. So in the present case, I've only considered um, square um, symmetric matrices where you correlate n objects with themselves. But it's clear that in many empirical problems, you want to correlate n objects with m other objects that may have absolutely nothing to do. So for example, maybe you've heard about this uh, uh, sunspot problem where stock markets are supposed to be correlated with the activity of the sun. So you, you could you know, correlate anything with anything else. So in, in, in general, uh, cross-correlations have uh, uh, n rows and m columns. And it's interesting to ask the same questions when n and m go uh, to infinity. And in particular, how to clean these um, cross-correlation matrices. So since these are rectangular matrices, you don't, you, you shouldn't, you, you, I mean, the, the notion of eigenvector doesn't, eigenvalues and eigenvectors don't make sense directly, so you have to use uh, an SVD representation. But the, this R, the rotationally invariant estimator that I told you about, uh, I said en route, but actually now we've done it, so we have a, an explicit formula that generalizes my F1 and F2 formulas, these ones, for the case of uh, the singular values of more generic, general. Uh, uh, correlation matrices. Um, what's interesting is that uh, I, I've insisted on the fact that there's a Dyson motion description of the additive case. Uh, we believe that there's also a Dyson motion description of the of the multiplicative case, but for the moment we we haven't been able to. Uh, I mean, again, there are leads, but we haven't completed that project. Uh, yet. Something that I find interesting is, as well, maybe um, there's no nice solution, but it seems that the, it's possible, at least in some sense, I mean, there are already results showing that some of the free algebra cannot be uh, generalized, but I think there might be interesting interpolation schemes between the, the trivial case where you add two matrices that commute. In this case, it's obvious that you don't change the um, uh, eigenvectors and you just add the eigenvalues. And the free case where you have another rule for addition, which is more complex but explicit. And, and you see, I, I've, I've tried to insist on the fact that freeness means that the, um, the direction of the eigenspace are completely independent from one another. Maybe there's, there are ways to introduce some correlations between these directions that makes some, um, uh, some generalizations interesting. But uh, although we have very preliminary ideas, I, I, I don't have much to say. I think it's just an interesting question. And an obvious thing also that you can ask is, in some cases, there is a prior in information on eigenvectors. How can one use it to um, go beyond this, this rotational invariant uh, estimator. For example, in the case of uh, financial markets, it is clear that, um, and actually Matteo worked on that a long time ago, that the, 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 the largest eigenvalue, the one corresponding to, you know, actually in, in this uh, scale, the largest eigenvalue is out of the window here. And it corresponds to what people call the market mode, that is a portfolio made of, uh, say, 1 over square root of n uh, on, each, uh, on each stock. So you, you take an exposure to the market, to the, to the market with an equal weight. So there's a prior which is just you know, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Uh, the, the largest eigenvalue should be around this direction. And, uh, and, and those, those, those here are related. I mean, you can read some economic information in, these, in the structure of these ones related to uh, economic sectors, for example, you know, uh, energy or the banks or things like that. So, so it's not true that we have no prior information. But the way to marry this uh, prior information with this idea of uh, rot rotationally invariant uh, estimators is, I think, to be worked out. And on this, I finish. Thank you. So we have some good time for questions. Uh.
So if uh, your sample contains uh, the crisis, like 2008, but do you feel seen deviations uh, from that? Yes, okay, so, so, so for example, something that you can do is to extend the Wishart ensemble in cases where you have uh, parallel distribution. And what you see is not, it's pretty obvious that you can be dominated if you compute a, um, a, a covariance um, and that the returns are very large on some days, then even if there's no correlation, but these two objects happen to go in the same direction the day when things move a lot, then you're going to find some spurious correlation because everything is coming dominated by this. So there are priors that you, that you can use to uh, account for the tails or account for the fact that the volatility of the markets is itself changing in time. There are periods where the volatility is large and periods where it's smaller, but you can extend these wish out uh, ensembles to account for, for, for these uh, non-stationarity, if you want. So, um, a question on this uh, minor console. You use maximum likelihood estimators uh, for the true eigenvalues of uh, C that exactly coincide with the uh, eigen uh, with the sorry eigenvectors of C, which coincide with the eigenvectors of uh, exactly. M. Yes. But then you show that there is a, a huge hybridization. So, what? I mean, the question is. Yes. That's that's why because of this uh, hybridization. That's why. You, you have a non-trivial result for Xi hat. Yeah, so... Uh, and this is exactly the, what in the end tells you that the, the best estimator is not to take the empirical uh, vec uh, uh, matrix that you've observed, it's to take only its eigenvectors, but you have to shift the eigenvalues by some quantity yeah. because, of this, because of this mixing. So essentially, so this mixing tells you that so eigenvalues have a, satisfy some laws of large numbers. Yes, 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 absolutely. Uh, um, but still you have, uh, you are choosing uh, essentially the, the same eigenvectors. Uh, so is, is yes, because, this, uh, because there's no prior, because you can't do anything else, because you have no prior. That's the hypothesis of this rotationally invariant uh, prior. What, what else can you do? You know? Of course, yes, 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 yes. No, I understand. But say, uh, imagine what would you get uh, if you could, for example, do a fully Asian uh, approach? Then no, that, that you, you get the same. You know, the, the Bayesian approach tells you that the only thing you can do is to take uh, you as, the, as your prior for the eigenvectors of C. To, again, as I said, there's nothing else you can, you can do. The only thing you can play with is not the eigenvectors, it's the eigenvalues. That's the only thing you can do. Because of the rotationally invariant assumption. And that's what I was saying in the end. If you have more information, then the problem becomes maybe more interesting, but also more complicated because you break the rotational, rotational symmetry. But that's, that's exactly the point. And you're right. I mean, there's a law of large numbers that means that in the end, the only, inf I mean, that the, what's really nice is that M, the noisy version of C, contains enough information to compute these overlaps, even if you don't know C. But that's because er, er, all these results are true in the large N limit. They're true only, so you have a lot of information actually. So, again, Sorry. Uh, couldn't yeah. you modify a bit your, your prior, I mean, the uh, this this uh, the formula for, for theta, I mean, uh, on the previous page, by mixing, uh, by mixing a bit the eigen eigenvectors ui, which are close, which are close by uh, eigenvalues, somehow. It's here is, I mean, this uh, this uh, estimator is diagonal in this basis. It's a diagonal matrix in this uh, in this basis of the uis. Mm -hmm. Couldn't you somehow mix a bit, uh, include off diagonal terms, but only near, which are close. It's concerned with eigenvectors which are close by uh, in energy. Uh, well, I think that in this case, it means that you're, you have a prior that, that is not rotationally invariant. So that, that's what I said, that if you have an, a rotationally invariant prior, then the, the maximum likelihood is diagonal. Is diagonal. 
but I'm not saying that in concrete cases this might, this could be a good idea. But uh, I think that's what's interesting, in my opinion, about what I said at the end, trying to extend this to non rotationally invariant ensembles and see what you can do. The size on which you, you have to take your averages for the overlaps in order to use yeah. uh, any, uh, any window of, of, of size. Uh, uh. So, yeah, so here there's a little bit of numerical experiments to, to optimize this. What we found is that, so I said it should be large compared to 1 over n, but small. Yeah. And so uh, 1 over square root of n seems to be a good compromise. Can we expect that uh, each of the component uh, is uh, converging to, to, to some um, in distribution to some Gaussian or uh, as it is for the, the eigenvectors of uh, G um, uh, I think in, the, in this rotationally invariant case, yes. Thank you.